Good evening in New York. Good morning in Nagasaki. Good night in Europe, Africa, in Israel, and the rest of America. I mean, good, <laughs> good afternoon and night. And welcome whatever time of day or night it is for those joining us from the rest of the world. I'm Yael Danieli, founder and executive <laughs> director of the International Center for the Study, Prevention and Treatment of Multigenerational Legacies of Trauma, ICMG for short. Thank you for joining us uh, for our webinar on descendants of both sides of the atomic bomb searching to repair the world together. Uh, Your, your moderator, that's me, is a clinical psychologist, victimologist, and traumatologist who has devoted much of her my time and career to studying, treating, and preventing multi-generational impacts of massive trauma to victims' rights and to reparative justice. Our first presenter, Kathleen Birkenshaw, is an award-winning Japanese-American author, speaker, and a second-generation Hibaksha. Her novel, The Last Cherry Blossom, is the United Nations Office of Disarmament Affairs Education resource for students and teachers. For the past 10 years, Kathleen has spoken to thousands of students around the world about the humanity under the mushroom clouds, amplifying her message of the imperative need for nuclear disarmament. She has done an extraordinary job as the ICMGLT Advisory Council member and chair of its working group on nuclear issues, while combating daily her debilitating intergenerational legacy. This webinar would not have been possible without her, and without Barbara Newsom's diligent commitment to this crucial work. Kazuhiro Ihara, our second presenter, is a second generation Hibakusha from Nagasaki. Kazuhiro's father, Toyoichi, was exposed at the age of nine and passed away in 2018 having served as the second chairman of the Nagasaki Atomic Bomb Survivors Notebook Friends Association, now assisting to the third chairman of this association, Kazuhiro San is a member of the Nagasaki Citizens Association for the promotion of the TPNW. And let me give you a quote of that Kazuhiro San believes in. In order to give children a world without nuclear weapons and war, we as global citizens must eliminate nuclear weapons. The third will be Barbara Newsom, who is a daughter of Nagasaki atomic veteran F. Carter Newsom, MD. Barbara will share the impact on their family of her father's year of service as a United States Navy medical doctor after the atomic bomb in Nagasaki. Her family's experiences influence her over 50 years career as a nuclear safety and security professional. Barbara now focuses on exploring aspects of the atomic bomb trauma that need to be widely recognized and addressed by decision makers. Barbara too has served admirably on the working group on nuclear issues as an, and as an ICMGLT advisory council member. Last but not least is David Seaborg, an evolutionary biologist, passionate environmentalist educator, president of the World Rainforest Fund, speaker, 
author and poet. David will reflect on growing up as a son of Nobel Prize winning chemist, Glenn T. Seaborg, who discovered and isolated plutonium, thereby significantly contributing to the Manhattan Project's atomic bomb development. David too has recently joined ICMGLT's advisory council. You will see that while there have been many foci around the world about physiological uh, uh, transmission of the bomb, uh, about the, the, the effects on the earth, on, on its sauna, on fauna, on, on trees, on uh, uh, water, uh, we are focusing on us as people. We have about an hour and a half for the webinar, though we have been known to run over time. Each speaker will speak for about 10 minutes. Following an interchange among us, I will open the floor to questions or brief comments from the virtual audience. Panelists will then conclude with last words. Please use the chat function and we'll do our best to respond to as many as we can. Feel free to, to direct your questions to particular panelists or to the full panel. I give the screen for to my beloved Kathleen. Thank you very much, Yael. It is an honor to be here tonight and to be a part of this advisory board at ICM GLT and working with Barbara and Yael to organize this meeting. And I'm very happy to be with the panelists today. I thought that I would talk a little bit about how my childhood, uh, growing up with my mom, and how that shaped the uh, beginning of being a second generation Baksha with a mission for nuclear disarmament. When I think back to being five years old, I have these memories of my mom laughing and smiling as she would tell me the Japanese folk tales, especially her favorite stories. I also remember the feeling of love and comfort I felt when she would rub my back as she sang Japanese lullabies and children's songs, especially uh, the Sakura, the cherry blossom song. But I also have a, a memory of her sitting in a darkened room, holding, almost studying the people in the pictures that she had. They were six pictures that she had left from her childhood. But the memory that really sticks with me from being five years old is the first time that I woke up to my mother's blood curdling scream from one of her nightmares. I never knew what the nightmares were about. She would not tell me. And I wouldn't even learn until I was 11 years old what she might have been dreaming about and the fact that she was actually not from Tokyo, as she told me and everyone else. When I was 11, my mother had increased nightmares at the beginning of August. And I was able to put it together that the year before she had the same. And I finally was able to get her to tell me why. And she then told me she wasn't from Tokyo. She was actually from Hiroshima, but she lost her family and her home and her friends on August 6th to the atomic bomb. She wouldn't tell me anything more. She said it was still too painful for her. And then she said, don't tell anyone. So the older I got, I do remember her telling me stories of her and her beloved Papa and what they would do, but she continued to avoid discussing August 6th. Throughout my childhood and even my adulthood, I remember any time my mother would start to feel ill, if she felt overly tired or if she got the flu, she would immediately say, this is the time I'm going to die. I was frightened as a child to hear that. I didn't understand and I couldn't fully comprehend the intense fear of radiation sickness that she had and expected to get at any moment. 
I was 31 years old when I finally learned what haunted her in her nightmares. I had become very sick. I was hospitalized with a near fatal blood clot at the age of 31 and was in the hospital with complications for over a month. When I returned home, I had trouble taking care of myself and my daughter, Sarah, who was four at the time, while my husband worked during the day. So my parents came to help. And it was during that time I was diagnosed with reflex sympathetic dystrophy. And that's a chronic neurological progressive pain disease affecting the sympathetic and the immune system. Physicians have said that my immune system deficiencies are due to the radiation that my mother was exposed to on that horrific day in August. My life suddenly changed with that diagnosis. I had to give up a career that I had strived very hard to achieve. I worried that with the increasing pain and disability of how to take care of my daughter, uh, who was four. I became very depressed and very despondent. And my mother then started to talk to me about August 6th of what she went through and the days after. And she told me the reason she wanted me to know all of that is that she had planned to commit suicide, but she did not. And she is so grateful that she didn't because she had me and my daughter to love. And that I had the same strength and samurai blood flowing through me that she had. So I would also find my own new way. Now this would be about nine years after that when my daughter got involved uh, with this story, with how I became the second gen Havaksha. She came home from school very upset. She was in seventh grade. And she said to me that they just finished their section on World War II. And she overheard some kids talking about that cool mushroom cloud. And she asked if I would talk about the people that were under it that day, like her grandmother. Now, I had called my mom to ask because I did not tell anyone. I did not talk about it in public before. And I thought she was going to say no. But she surprised me by saying yes. And her reason was that the students in that class would be about the same age that she was. She was 12 and a half when the bomb was dropped. So maybe they could relate to her story better. And more importantly, she knew that every student would be a future voter someday and that they would leave that classroom knowing that nuclear weapons should never be used again. So I visited with that class and I gave them the story so they would understand and connect with what happened to my mom that day. She was sick over the weekend. August 6th was a Monday. And her papa let her stay home one more day to rest. The next day, she would join the other students who are in the center of town. They were removing, trying to take down the wooden buildings. So if the fire bombs that were dropped on Tokyo back in March um, they wouldn't burn up the city so quickly. So that put the students in the center of town that day at 8.15. Her papa normally worked from home and then in the afternoon would go into town to the newspaper company. However, that day, he had an employee who needed a train ticket to visit an injured son who was further away uh, on the other side of Japan. So her papa still had the means to purchase the ticket and he was at the train station at 8.15 that day. She remembers being outside chatting with her best friend. Her friend was a couple years older, so she was not in the center of town. And as they spoke, she said she heard a plane, but it was a weather plane, so they didn't worry. Then a few minutes later, another plane and a siren and an ear shattering popping noise and this intense burst of white light. And the ground was shaking so much underneath them that all they could do was grab each other and scream. By the end of that day, my mother would have watched 
her beloved Papa die. And she would lose that friend that she was only clinging to hours before. And over the next few years, she would lose all the family members that she grew up with to radiation disease. And I, I get so emotional when I talk about this because I hear her voice telling me this story. And she was a woman who did not cry in public, but to see her cry as if it was happening all over again in front of her as a 12 year old, that sticks with me in my heart. My mother had lost so much that day, but yet she never lost her ability to love. But she also had no way of processing what happened to her. She was too young to understand why it happened, but she was old enough that she would never forget every moment. And during my childhood, I witnessed and I reacted to her outbursts of unexplained anger, her depression, her fears of loud noises and other issues that I didn't understand why she was so worried about, her hellish nightmares that she had until the day that she passed away, they never left. And I live with it now as I continue to battle with reflex sympathetic dystrophy as it progresses and having spinal surgery and learning to walk again. I was blessed though, because my mom lived to be 82 years old and she was not ill as much as she expected to be until the last few months of her life. And I was so grateful that I could show her the publishing contract for the last cherry blossom. And she took that. And she put it next to a picture that always had a place of honor in our home. It was of her and her papa. It's behind me and I'll show it later. Um, and she said, thank you for honoring my papa. I was honoring her too, but she didn't quite see it that way. But then she did say to me, you know, I always wondered why am I still alive when I've lost everyone else, why? And she said, now I know. I couldn't tell my story, but I had you and you can tell my story. <laughs> she passed away uh, two months later in January of 2015. And since then, <clears throat> excuse me, since then, I've had the pleasure of speaking with thousands of students around the world. And the one thing that makes them realize the danger of nuclear weapons and wanting to take notice of it is a story of a 12 year old little girl in Hiroshima, something my mother had felt no one would care about. And it angers and it saddens me that the threat of using nuclear weapons is still very real. But it is my hope that through telling my mother's story and when people read The Last Cherry Blossom, they will then connect with the human beings, with the families and the citizens that were under that cloud that day. Because voters and future voters and leaders need to know of the lives that were shattered, the homes and the loved ones that were lost and the lifetime of physical and emotional scars that carries to the next generation. My mother was the bravest person that I will ever know. And I am honored that she entrusted me with these memories and with her heart. And it's her love and strength that emboldened me to keep pushing forward through my pain and disability, to keep telling that story of that 12 year old little girl, because disarmament is not just a political issue, a fiscal issue. And as you will hear from my fellow panelists, you will also know that it is a humanity issue. And at this point, I thought um, that I would share a few pictures of the first, second and third generation Habak shop.
Thank you, dear. <laughs> oh, that's your father. Yeah, her father. <laughs> Beautiful. This is a picture of my mom and her papa. My mom was about three years old. All of her pictures took place between the ages of three and five. They happened to be at a different home, but all of her other pictures were destroyed uh, with her home uh, in the atomic bombing. She's holding a little box of chocolates. And my mother told me the story is that she hated putting on kimonos. She felt they were uncomfortable, but her papa wanted her to wear her summer kimono. So he promised her chocolate but she would not let go of the box. And so finally, because of her stubbornness, he just took the picture. And it makes me laugh because I can picture her stubbornness as an adult and it fits so perfectly with her as a child. This is a picture of the Ishikawa family. This would be her, um, who she thought was her cousin, her papa, her stepmother, an aunt and an uncle. And this was a third cousin. Um, she didn't come to the house too often, but she did do some typing and came to some other uh, activities at the home. This area here though, that is where my mom was, but she cut herself out of that picture because she felt guilty. She was the only one still alive out of that picture. I wanted to show a picture of my mom in her backyard. It was one of her favorite places to be. And in this picture is my mother. And that was the little boy, cousin, her stepmother and a cousin and her papa. And she remembers very clearly that even though her house was two stories, when she looked at the street after being stuck under all the debris and she finally got out that there were no houses at all, that everything was down to the ground. I wanted to share, my mother would always call us the three Ishikawa women and that we could do everything together. So I wanted to show, this is my daughter when she was six months old and taken with the three of us. This is my daughter, Sarah, when she was in seventh grade, um, and that was when she asked if I would talk about my mother's story, and that's when my daughter really started to learn more about what my mother had went through, um, and then this is a picture of my mom and me when I was a year old, and this picture is one of the last pictures that I was able to take with my mom. Um, I'm just very grateful that I have this opportunity to continue to honor her and her family and to be able to be with the rest of the panelists here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, dear, dear Kathleen. Thank you. Kazuhiro-san. Uh, please unmute yourself yes. and uh, uh, you. uh, take a deep breath because this was not easy. Huh? Okay. <laughs> and we uh, and we are looking forward to hearing you. Thank you. Nice to meet you. As for the audience, we do have an interpreter, so this is what you hear. Uh, please respect, be aware of that. Thank you. Go ahead. Nice to meet you. My name is Kazuhiro Ihara. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay. A second generation atomic bomb survivor living in Nagasaki. It is a great honor to meet you all and participate in this webinar. Thank you, Kat. Kathleen and everyone at Peace Boat. My English is very poor. Please forgive me. Thank you for uh, joining us. We understand. Okay. <laughs> okay. I share screen. Okay. Okay. 
Rabbi, can you share the screen? Yes. Oh, no. Uh, okay. Uh, I was born in Nagasaki and moved to Tokyo when I entered university. After graduating from university, I got a job at a theater company in Tokyo and have been involved in theater activities. My father is Toyokazu Ihara, and my mother is Kazuko. Both were born in Nagasaki City. They got married in 1957, and I was born in December of that year. It was 12 years after the atomic bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. My mother had been evacuated to suburb of Nagasaki during the war, and she was able to escape the damage of the atomic bomb. My father was exposed 6.5 kilometers from the atomic bomb drop center. As he was climbing tree to cut fire, the impact of the explosion knocked him off a tall tree and he was unconscious for a while. After graduating from high school, my father worked for an electric power company and eventually became a city council member and was active in the labor movement, peace movement, and nuclear abolition movement. He visited countries around the world, USA, Spain's Guernica, Turkey, Nanjing, South Korea, North Korea, Palau, Tinian, Nepal, Belarus, Ukraine, to talk about the tragic realities of war and promote world peace and nuclear weapons appealed for its abolition. He also investigated the aggression of the Japanese military, gathered the power of the citizens and erected the memorial monument for the POW camp victims in Nagasaki city and began exchange with the bereaved families of POWs from Iran, England, Australia, and the United States. And my father was also the second president of the Nagasaki Atomic Bomb Survivors Notebook Friends Association. In 24, my mother Kazuko died of cancer. And in 2019, my father also passed away from cancer. He was 83 years old. It is not clear whether he cause of death was uh, after effects of the atomic bomb. However, there is no doubt that one of the reasons why he devoted his life to peacekeeping activities was the tragic effects of the war and the atomic bombing. Nagasaki is the city that suffered the damage of the atomic bomb after Hiroshima. From an early age, we have known the miserable conditions and hardships of atomic bomb survivors. The fear of not knowing when they will fall ill and the fear of radiation damage that could affect children. My father was not directly affected by the atomic bomb, but he was worried that the radiation would affect me. Now, I am, uh, no, wait a minute. Last June, my younger brother, Toshia Ihara, was diagnosed with lung cancer. I retired from my previous job and made a U-turn to my hometown of Nagasaki last year. This is because I thought <clears throat> that I should carry on my father's and the 
younger brother's wishes and continue with my own activities. Now I am working as an assistant to Masao Tomonaga, the third chairman of the Nagasaki Atomic Bomb Survivors Notebook Friends Association. This group, which consists of Hibakusha and second generation Hibakusha, rings a bell for peace on the ninth of every month holds meetings and continues to call for the realization of the peaceful world and the abolition of nuclear weapons. Dr. Tomonaga has been studying the effects of radiation of humans for many years. Led by Dr. Tomonaga, this group seeks a balance between reason and empathy. While standing by the Hibakusha and sharing their thoughts. In April of last year, we formed a new group called Nagasaki Citizens Association from the promotion of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons to raise public opinion in favor of the Nuclear Weapons Convention and call on citizens of the world to act together. I attended the first conference of the parties to the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons held in Vienna in June last year. Together with Chairman Tomonaga, the advent of the TPNW has, was, has brought dramatic change to the world today. Many citizens of nuclear weapons states and even nuclear umbrella states are calling on their governments to join the TPNW. After the conference, I tested positive for the coronavirus and was quarantined in Vienna just before turning to Japan. Unfortunately, my brother passed away at that time. This is my brother, Hoshi Ihara, and and. Kiyomi Igro, age 19. Last year, Russia invaded Ukraine and hinted at the use of nuclear weapons. And the military expansion is also progress, progressing in the East Asian region. Peace is threatened. Nuclear weapons are weapons of absolute evil. It not only kills people directly, but also injures the survivors and their descendants physically and mentally for a long time. War is stupid. Let's repent of the sins we have committed and stop fighting again. It's not easy, but the collective power of citizens of the world was, has brought the TPNW into force. It is important that citizens around the world join forces and continue to advocate without giving up. Save the environment, let's save the earth and end conflict, help the nuclear victims. Do you know Takashi Nagai, associate professor of Nagasaki Medical School who suffered himself severe neck injury but bravery rescued survivors of the atomic bombing. Love the world. Love your neighbors as yourself. Bible, Luke chapter 10, 27. He wrote books such as The Bell of Nagasaki and continued to appeal to horror of the atomic bomb, the foolishness of war and the importance of life and peace. I believe that is necessary for the future of humankind, that each citizen stands by those who are in trouble and thinks of them as their own. When I went to Vienna, I felt that the souls of my parents, my younger brother, and many of the victims of the atomic bombing were also there. And in unison, they would say, in order to give children the world with nuclear weapons and war, 
we as global citizens must eliminate nuclear weapons. I have only a small amount of power, but I would like to join hands with citizens around the world and sow the seeds of peace so that a big flower of peace will bloom. I would like to walk towards peace together with you. This fall, we plan to travel with Hibakusha to several cities in the United States. I hope to meet you all. Reading Catherine's book, I was touched by the friendship, the deep affection of the immediate family and the sad farewell of the girls in Hiroshima. Thank you for writing the book. Thank you for everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kazuhiro-san. What, what a wonderful presentation in superb English. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, might I add that to, for the, the sake of the audience, because some of you know, mm -hmm. that uh, there is a version of the Daniele inventory for multi-generational legacies of trauma also in Japanese. And there is a special version. This is a special version that attempts to study children of people who had been exposed to the bombs and to all of the other testing occasions, etc., all over the world. So we can indeed scientifically present the case that there are family, not only physical health, which is what most people look at, but also health and psychosocial and mental health effects. So I look forward to collaborating with your organization on that. We need to update the translation only with two words, <laughs> and then it would be fully ready in Japanese. So please, we, we are looking forward not only to, to, uh, to uh, host you in New York, but also to work with you wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dear, dear Barbara, please take the floor. <laughs> oh, you are so kind. And first of all, I must say thank you all, starting with Dr. Daniele and Kathleen, who introduced me to her and her work, and then who worked with me to find our wonderful, so perfect representative from Nagasaki. Um, my journey to this moment will be very different from my entire career because I followed my father somewhat he was a medical doctor and scientifically oriented. I became a social scientist. Um, I'm a scientist now, I realized, because I spent my career in 1970 in my master's degree studying for myself in my um, Department of Defense contract program that was giving me experience. So at least in the world, I could say I'd been a researcher. And I was very surprised because my dad had nothing to do with it that I myself was studying the nuclear weapons effects on people for my country. The United States Office of Civil Defense, and that means how old I am, kept data that would help us help our citizens in the event of a nuclear weapons attack. Now this made it a lot easier for my father to talk to me technically about what he experienced in the war. 
Now, some of the friends joining me either now, tonight, live, or who will watch this broadcast know my father. And I know because of what people have said to me about my father, that he talked about this with his colleagues. And I'll talk about some of those colleagues in today's session. And he talked about it with his family. But in preparing for this webinar, I realized some, some even of my friends who know my father never heard us talk about it. And that's what's different for me tonight is this personal story. And I am always encouraged by Kathleen. Every time I read The Last Cherry Blossom or share it with a friend, which is how I got connected with all of you, and celebrate her translation into Japanese because this is a different career for me. And I want to tell you how it started. And Kathleen always paves the way for me because I will readily say before I start that I cannot talk about my father's experience in Nagasaki or my own understanding of Nagasaki without coming to tears at some point. And I have learned this and on Dr. Danielli's work, she says, we are mourning together. I don't know a single second generation who doesn't mourn and grieve. We have our own ways. And in my family, my dad, you'll understand, was very good at helping us express our emotions in appropriate ways. And so we were able to cry. And sometimes we couldn't help it. So my journey to today started in 2011. I was watching a Navy honor guard. And if you're from other countries, you may know or not know that when Americans have served in the military service for a certain kind of service, they are presented at their memorial of death and passage with a, um, a flag of the United States. And I was sitting on a beautiful April afternoon in Wichita, Kansas, at my family grave site when I was watching a Navy honor guard. And after the bugle played, one of our American traditional pieces of honor for those who serve, I was watching them fold the flag in the way that I had learned myself uh, for many years. And at the end, I had my head bow bowed down in very solemn silence. And I became aware that there was someone standing in front of me. Now, in our church service earlier that day, the honor guard had presented the flag to my mother. And my mother was too frail to come to the graveside. So as I saw someone standing before me, I was startled to realize that the flag was being handed to me. I simply had never thought about it. And when I looked up, I did not see the face of the sailor who was standing before me. I saw my father. And immediately I thought, oh my, my father is passing along a great responsibility to me. I never served an active duty military service as much as I have served <laughs> as a contractor in those, those positions uh, about nuclear safety. But I had never been in the military service. I thought, what in the world can my father be asking me to do? And then I thought of Nagasaki, still, still sitting there. That's all that came to my mind. And this has been my journey to find all of you at last. <laughs> and, and I have been working for a piece in nuclear disarmament since 1970 when I was doing my research, the first treaty, um, the nuclear treaty 
um, disarm um, non-proliferation treaty started, NPT, that we all follow so much. But what I want to share is a side of my father that not many people would have seen. And that was the side that I knew. And I want to share something very special. That day and, and since then, I've begun to realize I always knew about Nagasaki. And that sets me apart from a lot of Americans. And it set my dad apart from a lot of Americans. He had a lot of distance even in his own country. So for you veterans listening and veterans families, especially the atomic veterans, we've had an experience of our own as have the Japanese Americans. And I share the pain that you experience on many of these Memorial Days of, of the atomic bombings. And we have found one another to be able to share in personal ways that people have not heard. Now my dad, and I shared this story with both Yael and Kathleen, and, and I decided to start there because that very night, and I don't dream a lot about, about my parents, this is 12 years ago, 13 going on, that they both passed the same year within weeks of each other. You know, what I realized is I wanted to be certain that it was okay with dad to talk about his pain and the pain of, of many who served, not just the medical corpsmen or the physicians who walked into Nagasaki seeing something they didn't expect, that they didn't know was coming. And suddenly um, my dad went there in September where there was still just the most horrific <clears throat> human destruction still being cleared and also the people who had survived the initial blast were there. And to, to let ourselves realize the urgency of peace and the urgency of disarmament comes from that place, that core in the heart of every human who hears our stories. So I saw my dad, not as other people knew my father, outside of our home on the nights when he couldn't sleep. He was wearing the same clothes that he, I might see him in. He was wandering off to the kitchen to get a drink of water or maybe to sit and listen to some of his favorite music. He, he helped himself. So I want to talk about, for most important, what's, what's important now. And just to say that in our family, we too had some, some effects. Um, I was the oldest child. And to tell you just a little about my dad, I'm not as organized as the other two, <laughs> but I wanna sh show you my dad uh, and my mom because my story is very much my dad and mother's story. They were married right before the war. I should say they were, get, they were engaged right before the United States entered World War II. And dad was in medical school. So if I can do this right, I wanted to show you what my dad looked like in his senior high school picture. And, it, and there's a reason for showing this. This was a man I didn't know. I was born after the war, 1947, and I never knew my father before the war. What I knew was that he was from eight years old on, wanting to be a, a doctor just like his dad. He lived in eight years old in Florence, Alabama, where his father, who was also a veteran in World War I, was a physician and had a dream with his brothers who helped him invest in making a medical clinic to make good medicine available to everyone. People who couldn't afford it, people who didn't even know um, if they could get help from a physician, but that was my dad's, my grandfather's dream in Florence, Alabama. Now, by the time this photo was taken, my parents, I mean, my dad um, had, and his 
brothers who invested in a medical clinic had lost it to the Great Depression. They were there in the late 1930s and right before the depression started in the United States. They lost everything. They lost their home. They had to move back to Georgia where dad was born and his father became a surgeon for the Veterans Administration. So in this photo, my happy dad was going to work his way through medical school. And another photo of my dad is the one that informs my life. In order to finish- uh, we, we don't see that. We don't oh, you don't? You don't see no. it? Oh, I'm so no. sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. Well, I thought I might be screen sharing, but if I'm not, I'll figure it out later. So I'll just tell you that uh, my dad- we don't, we don't have it so much later left. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll do it another do time, see, perhaps. Do you see but the anyway. green? Oh. No, 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 no. But so my dad, to stay in medical school, joined the Navy. And he did his internship in Norfolk. And then because dad told the, the uh, military, uh, when they asked him his future, what did he want to do? Did he want to stay in the Navy? Dad said, no, my dream is to go and start a clinic in a small town somewhere. <laughs> and I'm not going to stay. And then he ended up on a battleship in the Pacific. That's my dad's story. But I'm glad he did because... If he had not been um, in the Pacific and doing what he did, I wouldn't be able to do what I do now. <laughs> <laughs> Which is to, to tell the side of dad that would keep him up at night. And he was, oh, and then when he went to the Pacific, the first thing he asked my mom for was, please send any books I had from medical school on psychiatry. He said, I really need that over here. <laughs> And then when he was in Nagasaki with the second Marine division who managed the occupation of Nagasaki and entered in September of 45 and didn't leave until a year later, when dad entered um, the, um, that service in Nagasaki, I want to close my story with the Japanese colleagues he met in Nagasaki because I'm hoping now we can make that connection and I can learn about their families as part of this process. But anyway, um, even then he said, what I most want is to study psychiatry and the older Navy doctors to give them some due credit. Dad was only 27 when he was in Nagasaki, 27 years old. The older doctors said the Menninger brothers in Topeka, Kansas, are starting a school of psychiatry. Mm -hmm. And my dad applied while he was still in Japan. And my mom, who was waiting for him, they went to Kansas directly from his separation of service. And every man in his first school of psychiatry at the Menninger Foundation was a veteran of World War II. Mm -hmm. And they healed each other as best they could. And they learned how to heal others. My dad always took the hardest cases and he was good at it. And I know part of the reason that my father was so successful was his year in, in Nagasaki. So I am grateful to all of you for making my father who he was. And he lived to be almost 93. He was just a few weeks short and he was the healthiest man I ever knew. He did get very high radiation exposure that year and in his case, it affected his eyesight. He, he was legally blind by the time he was in his 60s, but that didn't stop him from practicing medicine or stop him from doing just about anything else <laughs> to, to his last breath. <laughs> he, was, he was really um, quite someone to know. And so was my mother, who was the same. So that's my quick story, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to stay on the time limit, but I think you can understand perhaps why this means so much to me to be connecting with Nagasaki. And as we continue our discussion, I will tell you about the colleagues that my father met. I've had some people help me with the business cards. I was going to show a photo of business cards, but it's not doing share screen. But I can tell you about them as we go on into discussion. Thank you, dear. Thank you very, very much. 
It's my it. honor. It is my honor. And I must tell you that I do not talk to anyone from Japan with whom I do not say I am sorry mm -hmm. as an American. And I know I'm not responsible. I didn't build a bomb. I didn't decide to use it. But I want my country to do the right thing now. And I want my country to do more than we've done. And that's what I want to help my country do. And hopefully the center will help you help <laughs> and all of us. So. You're, you're actually giving me, and I thought I was retiring, believe me, but <laughs> no. I'm, I'm a young kid in this business. So you guys are helping me stay alive and try to stay healthy. <laughs> we know. <laughs> it's our special secret. <laughs> right. Thank you so much, dear. Um, that's why I added the word together at the uh, end of the title, that we are repairing the world together. Yes. Uh, certainly, it should not always be the role of the victim to repair the world. Mm -hmm. It should be everybody's role. Uh, sometimes former enemies, indeed. And maybe that's the way to peace. We will continue to try it out. Uh, David? I'm David Seaborg. I'm an evolutionary biologist and president of the World Rainforest Fund and the son of Len Seaborg. And it's great to be here. And I have just met you people very recently. And it's a pleasure to know you and be part of this and everyone in the audience i thank you for coming and uh, i was born on earth day what turned out to be uh, earth day on my 21st birthday not just any birthday but the significant 21st one and i was born barely in time to make it april 22nd 1949 uh, 10 more minutes than uh, it would have been the 23rd, it wouldn't have been Earth Day. And that is because uh, I made it on Earth Day because I came out very quickly and very suddenly. <laughs> and my father had pulled up the car to take my mother to the hospital and help her down the steps on Ellsworth Street in the city of Berkeley. Uh, but my mother said, Mom, we can't go. I'm going to have this baby right here and now. And I came out and my father caught me and delivered me. <laughs> and I would have then bumped my head on the porch. But he saved me in a natural uh, childbirth. Otherwise, I probably would have been injured. And so I guess I was anxious to come out to make it on birthday, on birthday. I remember riding one day in the car uh, and my father was concerned because I was a little kid down at his feet and he didn't want me there because of the radiation on his shoes. And I think that's my first uh, exposure not to try to make a pun uh, to the idea of radiation. One day when I was about 10 or 11 years old, I was in my uh, house in Lafayette, California, where I was raised for the first 12 years or so of my life, or I, a few years in Berkeley when I was very uh, young, but then we lived in Lafayette. And I answered the phone and the woman asked to speak to Dr. Seaborg. So I went out as an 11 year old boy to find my father and was out on the uh, paved uh, cement uh, driveway that we had. And um, that's right near a lot where we played softball. It was part of our, that was our property. And I forgot about my dad because I didn't see him when I was looking for him. I played softball for a half hour and went back up on the driveway and saw my dad and he heard the phone call. And 
instead of by the way that you're wanted on the phone. So he went and took the call, came back five years later and said, David, do you know who you kept waiting on the phone for half an hour? And I said, <laughs> no, who? He said, President Kennedy. <laughs> so I didn't uh, get punished for this. My dad thought it was funny. Um, he, people may not know that the reason his involvement here is he revised the periodic table. So he took the actinate series and put it down below the last lanthanide series. People thought before that, that it should go, the actinate series should go on the main part of the table. So that was one of his main contributions and why he shared the Nobel Prize with Ed McMillan in 1951. But he uh, invented 10 of the transuranium or heavy elements, not naturally occurring. So he had to make them, invent them. And uh, the last one was 106, Seaborgium, named after him. But number 94 was the first one he invented, and that is plutonium. And that is the one used in nuclear reactors and the bomb. And that's probably why I'm speaking here today. He had a sense of humor. It would normally have been uh, atomic symbol PL with the first two letters, but he knew if its effects. So he decided to make a little fun and give it the top the atomic symbol PU. And uh, so I went to St. Petersburg to the uh, conference on the 150th anniversary of the uh, periodic table conceived by Dmitry Mendeleev in St. Petersburg and was the keynote speaker there on the periodic table conference uh, because of my dad's work there. So I was the only non-chemist there. Uh, my mom worked for E.O. Lawrence, the man who won the Nobel Prize for designing the cyclotron on which my dad did his work. And my dad went in to dictate a letter and was very impressed with my mother and ended up marrying my mom as a result. Uh, the Nobel Prize winner, Melvin Calvin, who worked out photosynthesis, was a friend of my dad, and he showed up to pick up my dad at the airport with mom in the car, and then he uh, lent the car to my father so they could go on a date. So he did a little bit of matchmaking, which helped lead to my birth. Well, my father shared his views on his work on the bomb. His work on the bomb was part of the Manhattan Project where he isolated plutonium. So at Berkeley, he uh, discovered or invented plutonium up on the hill at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, which was then called the Radi Berkeley Radiation Laboratory with the cyclotron. But uh, at the uh, metallurgical laboratory in Chicago, as part of the Manhattan Project, he isolated plutonium to develop the bomb. So he spoke to me a few times on his feelings about his work on the bomb. And he said he did not feel guilty about the work because he felt that uh, the war had to be ended, that uh, Hitler had to be stopped, and it was very important work to uh, stop the Nazis and uh, save lives by ending the war earlier. Although I have learned later that the saving lives part of the bomb uh, has been questioned, that the Japanese really would have surrendered anyway. The narrative we're giving is that we say many, many lives that Japan would never surrender. Uh, but it was from this group here that I learned that Daniel Ellsberg said that uh, the Japanese, in fact, would have uh, survived or uh, surrendered anyway. And Ellsberg has a lot of credibility with me. 
but at any rate, my father's view at the time was he wanted to stop the march of the Nazis, so he didn't feel uh, guilty. However, once he developed, uh, helped develop the bomb, he did not want it to be carried on into a Cold War with the spread of nuclear weapons. And he worked very hard to uh, have bilateral treaties to stop the development and spread and uh, increase of nuclear weapons. And he um, did not support the nuclear freeze so much. What he really wanted was a ban on testing. And uh, that was at the time when there was a partial ban. In fact, um, when I gave his eulogy, I said that I think his most important contribution to society was actually uh, when he was chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, which is now a cabinet level position, the Department of Energy. His um, work uh, uh, there was to help us get the nuclear test ban treaty, which was the limited nuclear test ban treaty. So it was limited in its stopping of nuclear tests. It uh, stopped all nuclear tests in the atmosphere and it prohibited them in the sea and they still went on underground. And so that we got under Kennedy and that was what I called his greatest contribution, even greater than his science when I gave his eulogy at Zeller Beck Hall at UC Berkeley. And um, we had after that under Clinton finally the comprehensive test ban treaty. So there's no legal, no more testing of nuclear weapons, at least uh, not by the signatory nations. North Korea still does. Um, and that's what my dad pushed for and wanted was a total ban on tests. And we did get that. Now, one of my big memories was when we lived in Washington, D.C., and my father was chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, was a plan that if there was a nuclear war, that we would um, have the whole Seaborg family, which was my parents and five siblings, so six children and dog, get into the government chauffeur's car and go to a place in Maryland called Germantown. Uh, the Atomic Energy Commission, of which my father was chairman, had its um, office where he usually worked at H Street in Washington, D.C., but um, it decentralized in case of a nuclear war uh, so that it wouldn't be as easily bombed and had a main office out in Germantown. And we were to go to a bomb shelter by car if there was a nuclear war in Germantown, about a 45-minute drive in ideal traffic conditions from our house. But I knew that there would uh, be not anything but ideal traffic conditions, that it, everything would be clogged with traffic jams. And even if we got there before the bombs came, we would never get out of that shelter because of the radiation and other effects of nuclear war. So I remember thinking that was a big joke. Um, and I had some real terrors. Um, when Ke President Kennedy was shot, I remember I was in my room all alone feeling uh, pain in my stomach and a great sense of fear. It was like a psychic feeling of fear for the future. And I'm sure a lot of that had to do with uh, the desire of forces behind the assassination of President Kennedy to continue the development of nuclear weapons by the United States, because Kennedy wanted to do quite a bit to uh, stop that, as did Nikita Khrushchev at the time after the Cuban Missile Crisis. I also remember my real fear during the Cuban Missile Crisis 
And one time when I was a graduate student in Berkeley, when I saw the uh, lights of San Francisco uh, partially blacked out and I had just awakened from a dream and I was not fully awake and I thought San Francisco had been bombed and I had a, a, a real scare attack there and called the operator and asked if everything's okay and she said everything's fine sir uh, but I think because of being raised by my father I have more awareness and concern about uh, nuclear war. Um, so my father and I had debates, not so much about nuclear weapons, because we agreed about the need to eliminate them, but nuclear power, because I was not very enthusiastic about nuclear power because of its uh, ability it, of those who have it to develop nuclear weapons and also because of its um, long-term waste. And uh, he was very much an advocate of nuclear power. We debated this a, while, a number of times, but then I, I kind of gave up. It sort of made me feel sad and, and hurt me to talk to him about that. But I wanted solar and when he thought solar at the time was a pipe dream. Um, uh, I had a friend named Thomas Tinamori, who was a survivor of uh, the bombing of Hiroshima. He was blind, and we became friends. Before I met him, he offered to meet with my dad. My dad would not meet him because he was concerned about the bad uh, publicity. Um, I did see pictures of my dad later, and... When I knew my dad, I never thought of him as a sad person. He was a good father, very honest, very kind, very loving person. Uh, but he, um, in pictures, I noticed his face is sad. And that was interesting to me to notice uh, later on. Uh, that was after his death, looking at his pictures. Um, um, I don't know that I feel a lot about being the son of someone who was very important in developing the nuclear bomb. I, I um, don't feel a lot of guilt or sadness about it. Um, I might be out of touch. I'm not sure. But most of the feedback I get from people is... Um, people wanting to meet me and talk to me because they think he's such a great man that I admire for what he did for the earth, uh, for humanity. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, I did read the book in high school that moved me a lot, and that was Hiroshima by John Hershey which uh, passage in that I'll never forget where the people uh, who were uh, survivors of the bomb, some of them who were in the wrong area, had their eyeballs ripping out of their eyes. And that is really was a terrible thing to read. Um, I did have a, the fellow who invaded uh, Nancy Pelosi's home, David DePape, he had a girlfriend for a while named Gypsy Taub, who I did know years ago for a while. And she uh, gave me, uh, sent me an email about her father working on the bomb and how she thought it was a terrible, terrible thing and came to terms with it. And she sent me a rather lengthy letter about how I should um really repent and um you know feel bad about coming to terms with it and uh, i've had a few people people who um said a few things but uh it's very very rare mostly praise for my dad um i think i want to end up this with a plea uh, we need to get rid of nuclear weapons 
by a bilateral treaty where all nations agree to cut back equally in a fair way proportionately with inspections step by step till they are all gone. Um, I salute Japan for being very good about this and in, in their policy. And I think the United States and Russia, since they have most of the nuclear weapons, need to take the lead, although all countries who aspire to get them or have them also have responsibility and should not use the U.S. and United States, or United States and Russia having more of them as an excuse. And so we need to do this, including all nations and with inspections. And so we need to realize that, yes, the bomb, the blast of the nuclear bomb that kills and destroys is absolutely terrible, but that is not the worst aspect of nuclear war. The worst aspect is the environmental effects because the blast kills millions of people, but the environmental effects are great radiation all over the world and uh, what we call nuclear winter, which means that we will be covered in dust all around the earth in the atmosphere. That is not that the dust will cover us, but the dust will be up in the atmosphere and it will block out the sun. It will be dark and cold and no plants will grow. We will not be able to get food. There'll be radiation in the food and water at very high levels uh, that we cannot survive everywhere. And it will also destroy the ozone layer which blocks out the ultraviolet radiation from the sun and we will have damaging ultraviolet radiation coming through from the sun so not one human will survive in my view in an all-out nuclear war and it will be massive death and ex mass extinction of the fish the trees, the primates, the mammals, the amphibians, reptiles, birds, insects, there'll be a mass extinction, the sixth mass extinction of the history of the planet, and only very simple life will survive. So we need to stop and get rid of nuclear weapons and prevent nuclear war at any price and in defending Ukraine, we may need to make the highest priority not to escalate into a nuclear war. Nuclear war's danger is not that one side will sneak attack the other, but it's that things will accidentally go into a nuclear war that we do not want. It is the accidental miscalculations, misunderstandings, and escalation. And by the way, this has almost happened, full out nuclear war, it almost happened in the Cuban Missile Crisis when Kennedy was under tremendous pressure to retaliate and he stood up to the generals when there was a Russian submarine off the US coast that they had lost touch with Moscow Two of the commanders, two out of the three, wanted to launch their nuclear weapons on the United States. And the one person stood up who was not higher up in the Russian Navy than one of the others who wanted to launch, but he was the, in charge of the submarine. He was the head man on the submarine. He saved the world from nuclear war. There was an unannounced launch of a satellite from Norway that Russia thought was a nuclear attack. It almost got, it could have gotten into a nuclear war. The person told to launch said, no, I won't, because he thought it would not, was not really an attack. There was too much to risk. But we have had over a hundred close calls since we've had nuclear weapons. So this is very serious and we need to 
eliminate nuclear weapons. I thank you so much for your attention. It was such a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you, David. If, if, if thank you, David, for your thoughtfulness. Uh, please, panelists, would you unmute yourselves? Thank you. As a hero, son, I'm mute. Hmm? Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, we did a lot. On I think on we need to make efforts to understand each other like this discussion. Yes, yes, yes. You would uh, now, bef way before we go to the audience, please, uh, uh, please, what came to your mind or heart when you listen to each other? So now it's the phase of our webinar of interactions among you. If I might dare, and I'm taking a risk here, but I know that each one of you, I know you we stay together anyhow. <laughs> and David, uh, how, when you imagine that it was your dad's work that led to Kazuhiro-san's father's story. What do you feel? You're, you're seeing Kazuhiro-san. Uh, he, you heard about his father. You heard about his brother. Um, did, what did you feel? What did you think? Uh, uh, You know, it's difficult to answer that. I mean, of course, I feel sadness and compassion for, you know, the suffering for any human being suffering. I think it's hard for me to connect my father to that suffering. And I don't know if that is well, let, let me give some background about me really quickly. Um, I was raised um, by a scientist and someone who is uh, a first generation Swede, born in America, but, you know, emotionally repressed. He didn't express easily anger and um, sadness or and he didn't hug. He was a loving good father, but he didn't hug me. And my mother, she hugged me, but she was very much wanting a peaceful family. So she didn't like expressions of anger or great emotion. So uh, I actually went through therapy to better get in touch with my emotions. So I don't know if I'm repressing or not, because if I am, I, I wouldn't, that wouldn't be very good repression if I knew, I guess. Um, or it's possible that I think that my father did what he thought was the right thing at the time, and he, his responsibility is not um, he's not really responsible in that sense. It happened as a result of his actions, but he didn't intend that. So I'm not sure how much each of those things uh, is the explanation of, of why I don't feel, say, guilt for him. I do know that he signed the Frank report, which I didn't put into my talk, but he, there is a report that um, was written by Frank, F-R-A-N-C-K, that said that we should not drop the bomb 
on the Japanese, we should first do a demonstration bomb to uh, demonstrate it and allow Japan to the, the opportunity to surrender and give the uh, possibility that we would never drop it where there are civilians. And um, he was very proud of that. And he spoke of that, that it was unethical to drop the bomb on people that we should have followed the front report, but the government decided, no, we should drop the bomb. Um, I was emailed the front report by, I guess, from either Barbara or Yale, one of you two, and I am really happy to have it, and I haven't had the opportunity to read it, but I'm glad you emailed it to me, so I'll read that. So I guess that's the best I can do with that answer. Thank you. Kazuhiro san, hey. when you hear David, and you hear of David's father's history. Uh, <laughs> what do you feel or think? <laughs> and I'm so, I, I know I'm taking a risk and I know, but I think we are such a, a good group that we can, <laughs> we can open the discussion and maybe then inspire other people to do the same. Please. Uh, thank you. I think uh, humans are responsible for destroying nuclear weapons created by human. I think. I think so. Uh, uh, Kathleen, Barbara, please. Uh, well, <sighs> my mother would always say, that war was hellish for both sides. And mm -hmm. to smart, show- Smart woman. <laughs> um, and you know, she ended up marrying, my father was a white American who was in the Air Force and she met him when she was living in Tokyo. Um, and they got married at the US Embassy uh, in 1959. And then she moved to the States. And you know, <sighs> It was hard for her because she was very angry for a long time. But then the reason she met my dad was that she was not a violent person, but she wanted some way to get revenge. So she would date the American soldiers <laughs> to break their hearts. That was her way. Uh, she met my dad and then she realized that they can both sides can listen to each other. And she really, you know, she fell in love and she felt that there must be some way to get past this. And she moved to the United States, which was a huge thing for her to do. Uh, she still needed to learn the English language. Her, her stepmother and other people were not happy with her uh, to go to the United States. Oh. And when she arrived, it was only 14 years after the end of the war, but she thought, there wouldn't be such an issue anymore, but there was a lot of prejudice against her still. Um, and, and that is why she started telling people she was from Tokyo because she didn't want any more attention on her if she would have said Hiroshima. There were times that it was very difficult for her, but she learned English and then she became a United States citizen and she worked on the circuit boards that were for the Apollo 11 flight. So she kind of, when she came to the States, she decided that she wanted to make it part of her country as well. Um, it was hard to do. And she still faced prejudice from his side of the family, um, from other people. And that's why it made things very difficult for her. I don't think she felt she could talk about it. And our state, Rhode Island, was one of the last ones that still celebrated Victory in Japan Day. And that day was hard for her to see. Um, but she would never really talk about it that much. But she was, you know, when I went to Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and I spoke with students there, and that was one of the sites of the Manhattan Project. And a lot of these students there, their parents or their grandparents would have worked um, at the site, the hand, uh, at the site there. But I found that talking with them 
and just like we're doing right now from various sides, that one side doesn't demonize the other mm -hmm. and one side doesn't justify what happened. Mm -hmm. They're separate events and they were both horrible. The start of the war, the end of the war. And what the people were doing in the United States was their patriotic duty. And so um, there is that piece of it too. But I think we can all coexist. I think all of our stories are important to be talked about. Mm -hmm. And I think this shows that we can start this discussion. But now we all know the hellish and the horror that happens after the use of the topic bomb. So it's our responsibility now to then take this knowing the generational repercussions as well so that we need to not just talk about, but we need to demand that no family should ever have to go through that ever again. And I think that's how our sides can all work together. Mm -hmm. Thought of something in your question, which is that I think it's very important for me. It's not very hard for me to do, but it's important to do is not justify but you know what my father's involvement in the united states is actions by um you know japan attacked us in pearl harbor and so on uh i think japan's actions were terrible and i think that the united states has a right to defend itself but I think um, justification, uh, one has to be very careful with when it comes to uh, use and development of nuclear weapons. But I wanted to ask also, Kazuhiro san, uh, you were asked, uh, I wanted to ask again, uh, uh, Dr. Daniele asked you, uh, and you can use your translator, it might help you. Uh, if you have some feelings about my father and his involvement to develop the nuclear weapon. Unmute. No, no, unmute, please. Unmute. Good. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I think it. Mm, it is difficult, but it is necessary to recognize the perpetrators hmm? and victims of war and make effort to understand each other, I think. What about you, about my, my dad? Do you have feelings? I'm I feel that he was doing what he needed to do for his country and he was working on that. I, I don't really carry a lot of blame. You know, I, I think when I was younger, I didn't understand. And I don't know how I could have married an American if I was my mother, you know, I don't know if I could have done that. But I look at it now is that each side was doing, he was doing what he needed to do at that time. And I really appreciate the fact too, that, you know, he had that Franck report that he signed, you know, he, he knew what destruction could be and he tried to stop that. And I admire him for then working with the atomic uh, energy and then starting with a non-proliferation treaty. Uh, he, he worked very hard for nuclear disarmament in that sense. And so I do appreciate that. And and you know, I feel it goes with the same feeling of that now we know what could happen. So it's our responsibility to make sure it doesn't happen again, or at least try to, to get people. To Thank you. That. Okay. So here is an, anytime you want to add, please just unmute and add. And Barbara, you are uncharacteristically quiet. <laughs> <laughs> She knows me if they know me here listening. <laughs> she loves you. Yeah. Well, right. you know, oh, go ahead. Hiro-san. Kazuhiro-san. Kazuhiro-san. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, translating by Google. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> Google. <laughs> Google. Uh, excellent, excellent technology should be used for peace from now on. I can understand your thoughts. Understanding each other is better than apologizing for peace. Thank you for Barbara. Thank you for your gentle caring. Thank you very much. And <laughs> and David, uh, your uh, serious position, but I I can understand, and I can more uh, more speak to you. But next time, yes. Okay. Good. Good. Oh my, well, one of the things I have discovered in working on new relationships, like with David, I started with you and Kathleen and others, is how important all of the perspectives are. And I do want to mention, because of my own career, how important it is for the United States to hear all of the history, especially the history of the only country, Japan, who has experienced a detonation of a weapon in war. And I would say this on any program I'm on, David led up to it very well, the urgency of finding solutions could not be more pressing mm -hmm. than it is at this very moment. And the more we can find each other, those of us who, who know the truth about nuclear weapons. In 1970, and it was only my first year of research for the Department of Defense, I was presenting at the Pentagon as a young woman in my early 20s because my boss thought I could do it a few years later, I knew there was no point in trying to take shelter if there are nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. Just as David said right. about Germantown and, and, the, and the shelters. Mm -hmm. So my whole career was motivated by how do we share with people in a way that's effective, mm -hmm. in a way that doesn't just scare people. Mm -hmm. And I do want to mention one of my most important moments getting ready for this seminar was to read a book called Living with the Bomb by Dr. Laura Hain. And she had a, a, a sentence, it is living with the bomb is what we've done, whether, whether people want to face it or not, ever since World War II, ever since August 6th and August 9 in particular. They were very different events, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, if you know the history. Yeah, we are planning uh, yeah. a panel yeah. with you, so perhaps, yeah. so perhaps but, keep, keep people, keep people uh, yeah. eager to hear. <laughs> yeah, well, at any rate, you know, I... I because I also want yeah. to give the audience a chance to participate. Yes, and I would just say, keep yeah. keep looking for... There are some very popular books right now on the Manhattan Project. Keep looking for things like Living with the Bomb, who are written by the second generations. Right, right. Yes, and and they're not always the ones that are promoted, but um, she's become an um, Asian historian and wrote it for the 50th anniversary of the of the um, bombings. And so, the, but in the United States, I'm going to say this very plainly. It is very hard because so many have not really looked at all the perspectives or heard. Mm -hmm. It surprises people to know that not only the scientists, but also the military leaders in 1945 were about 50-50 on whether the bomb should be used or not. And that kind of history is just not known. Right. So we can do that. We can We can together as second generation, third generation, who know directly what happened. We have a lot of, I, my favorite word is Kathleen's responsibility. And that's what I talked with Dr. Hain about. What is our responsibility now 
in this moment of time. Yes. Thank you so much, dear. Uh, all of you will have a chance for a last <laughs> word, remember? But I really want the, uh, you know, to allow the audience participation. I don't see any comment on the chat. Wow. Uh, <laughs> it's a lot to take in. <laughs> oh, gee, I hope it's not uh, a bad sign for, for, uh, for involvement. <laughs> Uh, we still have attendees. <laughs> you know, I'm just going to say, this is a hard subject for people to talk about, very, in my experience. Very hard subject, yes. And, and we are, yeah. So, uh, well, how about for the record? Last word for this time, until next time. So last word, meaning what's your last message today? Uh, let's go back from David backwards. Okay, David, number one today. Well, um, one thing in the debate concerning should the bomb have been dropped on Japan, and there are arguments on both sides. Um, to think about is that if you, if a nation that has nuclear weapon bombs a nation that doesn't have it, then, then it is harder to convince nations without nuclear weapon not to get nuclear weapon. Therefore, a nation with nuclear weapon should never consider or threaten, certainly not use, ever, nuclear weapons on non-nuclear weaponized nations for the argument that that way you can have non-proliferation. Yeah. If, you, if you are going to be able to bomb a non-nuclear weaponized state, then why would the non-nuclear weaponized state be incentivized not to get nuclear weapons? Um, I guess the only other thing I would say is just to reiterate that we um, need to get rid of nuclear weapons and we need to work together. And we have been uh, kind of, in a sense, slaves uh, ever since I was born. I've been living under... Can you hear me? Is, can you hear me now? Okay. Um, been living under the threat of nuclear war. Yes. And Actually, can, the Asia, oh, I, I will interrupt because now uh, we do have two questions. Uh, the audience is uh, in joining us in. So actually, the, uh, the uh, Imari, we will talk. You will take you second because Blanche Moyeret Moy 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 uh, question uh, relates to what David is talking about now, which is how do we tell people so they can understand the danger of the nuclear bomb? Russia has threatened the use of the bomb. How likely is this? People don't believe anyone ever will. That's exactly right. Um, so, so I'll read the questions to all of you, all of the questions, and you will pick what, okay? And I will go to Joan Goddard. She said the chat is disabled, so that is why no question. Oh. Probably trying to leave it disabled, but want you all to know that we are very affected by your sharing and your information. People might be able to use this, uh, but <laughs> uh, then there is a question from Imari Yasuno. Thank you, Imari san. Thank you so much, she says, for the talk, everyone. I know this is a big question, but what do you think is the difference between the first generation survivor and the second generation? 
So we have uh, quite a few challenges. Who wants to start and with what? Go ahead, Kathleen. I'll, I'll start with the, the difference between the first and the, the second generation. From my own experience uh, with my mother, being a victim of that, she kind of would just not talk about it. She felt that her mm. voice would not matter. Um, when she moved to Tokyo after the bombing and um, she told people that she was from Hiroshima, they would physically take a step away from her. And so that made her realize, I can't say that's where I'm from anymore. And she also said the prejudice that was there. You know, if you marry someone who was involved in the atomic bombing, you might not have um, healthy children. And that is what stuck with my mom for so long that even when it came time that I was getting engaged, my mom said to me, don't tell him. I mean, by that time, I had already told him anyway, but um, and he still took me on. We've been married 32 years. But uh, I, I just think it's very different because some of us that I know who have uh, second generation, they weren't told stories about what happened. You know, their parents didn't discuss it at all mm -hmm. um, for various reasons that they may have had. And so it's made it very difficult for them. But they still want to do something. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I, I feel that because my mother didn't have a voice then, that I can give it to her now. And my daughter, being the third generation, can do that with the younger people as well. Um, and she's seen the effects physically and emotionally that happened between me and with my mother and, and what she dealt with. And so I think we, we experience by watching what our parents say, what they don't say, what they're going through. Mm -hmm. And then it takes a while to, for me anyway, to realize, well, what can I do with this? Mm -hmm. You know, especially because my mother told me never to talk about it. Um, you know, and I really credit my daughter, you know, being the one, you know, she was only 12, but she stepped up and she said, you know, I want them to know what happened. And uh, so uh, that's kind of how for me that it worked out from one to the other. Mary San, let me add that uh, I have I've written a great deal about exactly this question uh, and the, the, re the research I referred to before uh, is exactly about second generation talking about the first and themselves. So please make sure to be in touch with me through the center or with me at Y-A-E-L-D at AOL.com or write the center. It gets to me immediately. And uh, we can provide you with far more knowledge of publications, uh, of research that has been already done. Uh, and it would be very interesting to continue a dialogue with you. Thank you so much for the question. It's it's a very interesting question. <laughs> um, and the, the, the other two questions are back to, to how do we tell people without scaring them away? I think that is really the challenge of today, isn't it? So they don't deny, mm -hmm. so they don't just keep believing that, oh, Russia will never do it, uh, th that they don't distance themselves from what's right in front of our eyes. Yeah, and let's acknowledge before people attempt the answer that this is the question, not just for this panel, but I'm sure it's the question in the mind of every government today <laughs> and every human being today so uh, who who is as afraid as we are <laughs> when i think about it i get terrified uh, so it, it really is hard uh, no question uh, go ahead uh, please david you are in the middle of actually sort of trying to address yeah well i was kind of addressing that Yes. Um, what I was saying before, and then I'll get to the question, is that we are 
living, and I have lived my whole life, and many people have lived their whole lives, and many others a large portion of their lives, under the threat of nuclear war. Mm. And that's true of every human. That your net tomorrow is not guaranteed. It's the whole human race and much and much of the other species uh, could be wiped out in one day in a mass extinction. So we're living in very precarious, dangerous times because of the nuclear weapon. Now, as far as the uh, communicating that danger, the first thing is to be aware is that we are um, very, it is so scary. The thought is so horrible that people put it out of their mind and repress it. And Dr. Helen Caldicott who was the, I think, the co-founder of Physicians for Responsibility, a medical doctor who wrote about it and spoke and lobbied against nuclear weapons and nuclear war, spoke of this repression that people are so horrified by nuclear weapons that they repress it and put it out of their minds and it's too much to deal with, so nothing is done. But the fact is we can't repress it, we have to face it and we have to do something about it. Therefore, for communicating, we have to let people know that this is not a threat that can be sloughed off, that um, it would be the most horrible thing you can imagine if there's a nuclear war. And it's not something that's impossible. It's true that neither side would ever do a sneak attack. That would be suicide, but the danger of an accidental nuclear war is very much there. My father calculated it at 2% per year. That's just a guess. He didn't know. But 2% per year over many years, you have something called cumulative probability. Yeah. Those probabilities add up, and the probability over a great amount of time goes up. And so we have to communicate the reality that the danger is there and that the consequences are horrible, but we need to give people hope, which is that we can uh, overcome this and cut back on nuclear weapons. It's very hard because there are military interests, there's a lot of fear, and there's a lot of economic interests, a lot of uh, companies that benefit financially from nuclear weapons, but through continued uh, organized massive protest and lobbying and writing our representatives and presidents and getting out in the streets and working for their elimination and pushing for it, they can eventually be eliminated. One, uh, excellent. Uh, th thank you so much. Uh, now there was in the chat indeed, uh, uh, Cassandra Fralix uh, said Kathleen's book should be promoted to help young people address <laughs> the humanity of others. Yeah. Specifically, it will spe specifically it will give an opportunity to explore how it happened. We can dehumanize others. Yeah, and Kathleen answered. Thank you, Cynthia. My novel discusses the cultural, etc. And she gives in the chat. She gives a way to to uh, get the. She means Cassandra. Uh, <laughs> <Sorry>. uh, <laughs> she gives a way to or to order the book. And whenever you forget this link, you go to our website, and it's right under Kathleen's uh, picture in the advisory council. So. You can't get away without seeing it. <laughs> and I totally agree with you that it should be taught. And she's be running around uh, at schools to, to exactly make it available. Thank you, Cassandra. Uh, well, um, oh, could I just add, David did a beautiful, sure. David did a beautiful job of, of the technical understanding that we have who work in these areas, 
What my biggest problem is getting people to believe that it's possible. Yeah. No matter, and that includes experts, but, but my dad and I, that would be our message to everyone. It is possible. And part of it is that the advanced technology that makes an accidental, unintentional use of weaponry, now the technology is going to save us. We can detect when people are having nuclear fissile material that hasn't even been taken to where it might become a bomb. We can detect where um, bombs might be built so that there are ways actually for people to act effectively. Now, to do that means to reach people who can make those sorts of things happen. The decision makers, as David said, but but giving people real, what I call practical hope. It, and there are, just start looking on the internet. It's wonderful. From ICANN, the International Campaign for Elimination of Nuclear Weapons, start looking for parliamentarians for peace, two groups of parliamentarians. They've got great information on their sites. And start just getting to know what's possible right now. If, if people want to start with a plan. We don't have a plan, but we why not build one? Technically, it's possible to do this. And, and of course, what we have not done tonight is to, to go beyond mentioning the treaties that have been developed mm -hmm. uh, among countries, unfortunately, mostly among countries who are not nuclear countries, uh, to try to abolish and, and stop this crazy race to death. But uh, Charles Barker has said something very lovely, so we should read it for sure. Uh, um, uh, seems your group has developed what many call a quote circle of trust. I believe it is a model which should duplicate many times over to achieve the awareness needed and would inspire action to end nuclear war, uh, weapons and the threat. Just a comment, really appreciate what your group has shared this evening. Thank well, thank you very much, Charles. We will keep going. Uh, and let's give Kazuhiro-san the, the very last word for today. Uh, 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 <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Please come to, please come to Nagasaki and Hiroshima. I'll be waiting <laughs> for you. Thank you very much. Uh, I you. just wanted Thank to you, say David. there's a petition that scientists have written that many scientists have signed for the abolition of nuclear weapons. It's a recent thing. And um, now they are asking, civil, I mean, non-scientists to sign it as well and i have that in my email and can send that out to anyone who wants it wonderful perfect and again anytime you reach out to the center you get responded to if not immediately within a day or two so and we are all here together and let's give cassandra let me just read that out uh, she, uh, Cassandra writes, currently the military is focusing on modernizing nuclear weapons, that's right, which means creation of smaller nuclear bombs in South Carolina at Savannah River site. The plans are to create plutonium triggers for these new weapons. Nuclear weapon production is big business, absolutely, we know that. Yeah. Our fear of others had led us to create a world that sees the answer to problems as to make weapons to destroy that have different opinions. And uh, yeah, and we can, if we only reflect on that, uh, we can stay up for nights and days. Yeah. Thank you, Cassandra. Please yes. keep with us. Uh, and, and become one of the important voices in our dialogue. She's been doing wonderful things in South Carolina. We've been in yeah, touch before. You, you have to be in touch. That would be really, it sounds like we should. She said, thank you so much, Oliver. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> They're yes. telling me I have to. <laughs>
Thank you. I don't have enough words to say thank you. Uh, this, this this last person I they just sent this note missed my email address. Did you send it? Did you put it in the chat? No. So um, put, it, put it in the chat. And if not you, we can. Here we go. It's in the chat now, Cassandra. And and uh, you can you can also see it, Kazuhiro San. And at any rate, we have all the emails too. So as they fall out, we are here. And we are here uh, to continue. I, God bless you. Uh, good morning to you, Kazuhiro san. <laughs> good, <laughs> good evening, David. Good night, Kathleen. Good night. <laughs> Very in the morning. Love you very much. Thank you. Thank very you. Much. Thank you. Thank all you, for everyone. Yes. Thank you, Yael. Have a good time.